Welcome back to Math 11a. I'm Marty Weissman. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, limits and limits of sums of functions and differences, quotients and products. Uh, we're also going to talk about some challenging limits involving uh, the sine function and square roots. Here we go. So to start today's class, I want to talk about two things that are really fun and even funner, and those are limits and taxes. And I think they're a nice example of uh, a source of some functions which exhibit discontinuities and little points of non-smoothness, so functions that are kind of pathological in a way, uh, but are also realistic. So people have different ideas about uh, what, can, what constitutes a fair system of taxation. And you'll see some people talk about maybe a flat tax. An example of a flat tax would be something like everyone pays uh, the government 10% of their income each year. So if you make say $50,000, you pay uh, 45,000, sorry, you pay $5,000 of taxes. And your after tax income is $45,000. Okay, so this is one possibility. But a lot of people prefer some sort of tax that's progressive. In other words, the more you make, the higher percentage of your income that you pay in taxes. And here's one version of a progressive tax. It's one that's not really used, and we'll see why. So imagine a progressive tax where uh, there are two cases. If you make no more than $50,000, let's say actually strictly less than $50,000, uh, then you pay, just like before, 10% to the government. But if you make $50,000 or more, then you pay more in taxes, proportionally even, you pay 20% to the government. Now, let's see what this does by looking at two things. One is your income on this axis. And on the other axis, I want to plot your after-tax income. And there's this kind of critical point here at $50,000, where the policy changes. Now, up to that point, if you make less than $50,000, then you pay 10% to the government, which means that you're left with 90% of your income. And if you look at the graph, which really should be in green since we're talking about money, then the graph looks like this. And the equation of this graph is something of the form y equals 0.9x. In other words, the after-tax income, y, 
is 90% of your pre-tax, your ordinary income. That's what it looks like up to the point of $50,000. Now something happens here because this rule only holds up to $50,000, so there's a little hole in the graph right here. Now what about if you make exactly $50,000? You pay 20% to the government and that leaves you with $40,000. Maybe I should notice that right here, if you pay 10% to the government, then you're left with $45,000. Now suddenly, if you make $50,000, you pay 20% of that to the government, so you're left with $40,000, which jumps right down there. This is your after-tax income. And then the slope also changes because if you pay 20% to the government, you're left with 80%. So the equation changes and it looks more like this. It's not as steep as the previous one. The equation here has the form y equals 0.8x. Its slope is 0.8 instead of 0.9. That's how your after-tax income behaves. Now, people don't like this kind of tax policy because of this jump right here. What this jump means is that a person making $50,000 a year actually will have less after-tax income than a person making $49,999. That's this jump right here. In terms of limits, if you look at the limit, as your income approaches 50,000 from the left of your after-tax income, so this would be, um, let's just call this f of x, this function that I've graphed here in green, this is 45,000, but the limit on the right of f of x. Imagine you're making $50,000 or a little bit more. You're kind of walking towards this point from the right. This is 40,000. And these two things aren't equal, reflecting the fact that this function is discontinuous. People do not like discontinuous tax policies, especially ones that jump down, because they think that, well, if it jumps down like this, you're not going to be motivated to make that last $100. And people have weird behaviors when a slight increase in money will lead to an actual decrease in money in the pocket. So the two limits are different. Uh, the function has a hole right here. The actual value of the function is equal to $40,000 if you actually make $50,000 on the nose. Okay, so this shows why one version of a progressive tax uh, doesn't actually work so well in practice because of this discontinuity. So next I'll show you what people actually do, and uh, in the U.S. has been used for a long time, the idea of a progressive marginal tax. So let's look at our 2019 federal income tax brackets. Um, fortunately, I think we all have extensions to for when we have to file our taxes, but someday we will, and we might have to actually look at these numbers a little bit. So here, if you're single, living in the United States, you're in the 10% tax bracket on the money that you make up to $9,700. And the 12% bracket for that number, 9701 really, up to about 39,000. Then the 22%, notice the jump, 22% tax bracket between about 40,000 and 80,000. And then it goes up and the top tax bracket is 37% if you're making more than a half a million dollars, basically. But this is not the same as what we were looking at before, where if you're making half a million dollars, or 600,000, let's say, then you're paying 37% of your total income. This is what's called a marginal tax rate, which means that you're only paying that 37% on the money you make in excess 
of this 510,000 figure. Below that, you're paying 35% on the income that you make between these numbers, and so on down. So I've simplified this a little bit. Let's just look at the two bottom tax rates. And let's say that X is your income. If your income is less than or equal to $9,700 for the year, then you're going to pay 10% to the government. And this is modeled by the function, well, f of x, well, actually, let's, let's make two different functions. So this is kind of two cases. So in case one, the amount of taxes that you pay, the amount of taxes depends on your income, and this is equal to 10% of your income, or 0.1x. And the after-tax income, so this is your taxes, your after-tax income, let's call it A for after-tax, this is the amount that you make minus this, which is 0.9, 90% of your income you get to keep. But now if you make more, so this is if X is at most $9,700, if you make less than $9,700 a year. In case two, if you make more than $9,700 a year, say about less than 40,000 or so, then the amount of taxes that you pay will be 0 0.1 times your 9,700 because all of your money up to 9,700 is taxed at the lower rate. So that's 0 0.1 times 9,700 plus 12%, which is 0 0.12, times all of your income beyond 9,700. So that's your income beyond $9,700 is the excess, X minus 9,700. And that, if we simplify it, is 970 plus 0.12x minus 12% of 9,700. And 12% of 9,700 is something I should have worked out in advance. This is, uh, let's see, well, let me just do it. This is equal to uh, 970 is 10% plus another, so 2% of this, which is 194. And that is equal to, uh, uh, let's see, 0 0.12x minus 194. So this is what happens if x is between 9,700, so it's at least more than 9,700, and it's actually up to 39,475, which is when you're in the next tax bracket. Now, why do people set up such bizarre tax structures like this? Well, the graphs look a little bit nicer. So if we graph these two functions, so case one, if you make less than or equal to 9,700, and case two, where you make more than $9,700, then the graphs look something like this. If you look at the after-tax income, your after-tax income looks like 0.9x in one case. There's a cutoff at 9,700. And then at this critical point, when you reach this threshold, you start paying a higher tax rate, but only on the income beyond 9,700. And so it just sort of flattens out a little bit. So there's a corner here, but not a discontinuity. And then the next corner occurs at the next higher tax rate when the income, your after-tax income flattens out further. So there's none of these jumps which would incentivize people to throw extra money at bizarre things to avoid paying taxes in this, in this kind of federal income tax structure. Now, in this structure, I should say, uh, just for a little history lesson, if you look at these tax rates again, 
they go from 10% to 12%. A lot of Americans are in the 22% tax bracket or the 24% tax bracket. Um, if you look in other countries, like in Singapore, these brackets are back around 10%, very low taxes. The top end is 37%. Historically speaking, this is quite low. Like if you look around uh, 1960, the top tax bracket was around 90%. Basically, people who are making more than a million dollars or so in today's dollars, uh, they paid about 90% of that excess in taxes. Uh, that was about 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, nowadays, uh, no matter how much you make beyond half a million, you don't pay more than 37% uh, to the government. So these rates have changed quite a bit over time. Okay, so that's your lesson on marginal tax rates, where there aren't these discontinuities. The limits are the same from both sides. And kind of naive progressive tax brackets where there would be a jump. And now we'll get onto some more algebraic properties of limits. So actually, before we move on, there's one thing I forgot to tell you, and that's the equation of these two lines here. And this line here uh, that this person is walking up, this line is meant to be the graph of the equation a of x is equal to 0.9x. It's a, it's a line of slope 0 0.9, almost fully diagonal. Now, what happens here, this line segment, this is the graph of a of x in case 2. And there, the function a of x is 0.88x plus 194. It's basically x minus the taxes, x minus t of x. So 0.88 is now the slope of this line. It's a little bit flatter than this line. And the y-intercept is $194 if you continue this line through. So I just wanted to show you that because I've got these uh, graphs drawn here, but here are the equations. They're both linear. This is what's called a piecewise linear function. Uh, it's built out of these kind of linear chunks with uh, corner points attaching them. Uh, that's it for that. Now we'll move on. So now I want to look at some algebraic properties of limits. This is, I think, chapter 2.4 in the textbook. And a few of these properties uh, have the following form. They say that limits of sums and differences in products can be realized instead as sums and differences in products of limits. In other words, limits kind of behave well when it comes to addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Another limit law says that limits of quotients can be expressed as quotients of limits. But there's a very important warning here. This is only true if the denominator, the bottom of the fraction, what you're dividing by. So if the denominator uh, is non-zero, and let me even go further and say not near zero. In other words, just as long as the denominator does not involve zero uh, in the limit or along the way, then the limit of the quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits. And something similar happens with square roots. Limits of square roots can be expressed as square roots of limits, but here we have to be careful because the square root of negative numbers is undefined. So here you have to say if whatever is in the square root is uh, positive, or at least non-negative. So according to these properties, a lot of limits become easy if you just have to add and subtract and multiply. But limits become difficult, and by difficult I mean very interesting and also important if they involve quotients and square roots where sometimes the denominator might go towards zero or you might see some square roots of negative numbers show up. So I want to show you some examples of this with uh, something that's actually important. Uh, let's compute the limit uh, as h approaches zero of the square root of 9 plus h minus the square root of 9, all divided by h. Uh, 
Okay, now you might say this is the limit of the quotient. And so let's try just putting the limit on top and the limit on bottom. The limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits. And the top, actually, if I do this, it works out all right, because the limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. And the bottom still looks like this. And I can keep on going. The limit of the square root looks like the square root of the limit. And here I have the limit as h goes to 0 of the square root of 9. Can't really simplify this. The square root of 9 is a constant. It's 3 the whole way through the problem. Keep it there. And this limit, as h approaches 0 of 9 plus h, this is 3. So this is, or this is 9, the square root of 9 is 3. So this is something like 3 minus 3, and the limit as h goes to 0 of h is 0. And we're end up with 0 over 0. So is the limit then undefined? Well, it seems so if you use all the limit rules without thinking too much. But pay attention to these warnings which I've highlighted here. The limit of the quotient is only the quotient of the limit if the denominator is not near zero. The denominator, at the bottom of the fraction here, is approaching zero. And therefore, this first step here, this first step is invalid. the denominator approaches zero. So this is a problem which I've purposefully kind of messed up, and this shows how things get messed up if you just use these limit laws without paying attention to these warnings, that you have to make sure that the denominator isn't approaching zero when considering such a limit. So what we need to do to solve this problem is do something a little bit clever. There's a trick that's it's kind of in the standard mathematician's toolbox of tricks, which I'll show you uh, next. So now the trick that we're going to use to figure out this limit, it's uh, something that I would call the difference of squares trick. Uh, I'm not sure how many thousands of years old it is, but it's kind of a standard trick that's useful when you have something involving a difference of roots. Uh, it's a way of kind of squaring these things by multiplying top and bottom of the fraction by something. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that this limit is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 9 plus h minus the square root of 9 divided by h. And we're going to multiply this by an unusual looking expression, which is really 1. 9 plus h plus the square root of 9 divided by itself. Now, you'll notice that this entire expression here this is 1. You're usually not allowed to take something and simplify it by multiplying some complicated quantity. But if that whole complicated quantity is really equal to 1, then you haven't really changed it at all by multiplying by some exotic looking version of 1. That's the trick. It's not something that I'd expect you to think of. Uh, but once you see it a few times, you can get a hang for when it's useful. Okay, now why is this thing useful? I'm going to multiply this out. And the bottom of the fraction becomes h times the square root of 9 plus h plus the square root of 9. I just multiply the bottom of the fraction times bottom of the fraction to multiply the two fractions. For the top fraction, tops of the fractions, I could take this minus this times this plus this, and I could do all that algebra. But let me re re 
remind you of the formula for uh, multiplying things of the form a minus b times a plus b is always equal to a squared minus b squared. This is the difference of squares formula. Whenever a and b are real numbers, their difference times their sum is the square of the first minus the square of the second. This is a and this is b. Now, I have a minus b times a plus b. That's equal to a squared minus b squared. a squared is 9 plus h. And b squared is 9. So here, my a minus b times a plus b. Here's my a squared. Here's my b squared. Here's my a, and here's my b. So now I can really simplify things, because 9 plus h minus 9 is just h. So I have h on the top, and an h on the bottom, and some messy bit here, 9 plus h square rooted minus the square root of 9. Now you might look at this and be concerned, because you have a 0 divided by 0 thing. But remember, this is the limit as h approaches 0. h is not yet 0, and therefore h divided by h is still 1. Approaching 0 is not the same as equaling 0. So h divided by h cancels and I'm left with 1 on top, 1 on bottom. Or, simplifying this, I get 1 divided by the square root of 9 plus h minus the square root of 9. Now the denominator here, what is this? This is uh, the square root of 9. Sorry, this should be a plus. That would be a crucial mistake. This is a plus, that's a plus, this is a plus. This is the square root of a little more than 9, say around 9, plus another square root of 9. This bottom is not 0. It's never near 0. It's closer to 6 or something when h is small. And therefore, I can say that this is equal to the limit of 1, which is just 1, divided by the limit as h goes to 0 of the square root of 9 plus h plus the square root of 9. And now I can use the addition property and the square root property and all the things I want to say this is the same as just plugging in 0. This is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 9 plus the square root of 9 which is equal to 1 sixth, 1 over 3 plus 3. So when you're doing with continuous functions like square roots and sums and things like that, that, when there aren't any problems, then you can figure out the limit by just plugging in h to be 0. But it's only under those kind of circumstances. You can't plug in h to be 0 if you're in a situation where you've got quotients that look like 0 over 0 or other problems along the way. But as long as you do the algebra first and the limit towards the end, you can get to the correct limit, which is 1 sixth. One more comment is that I showed you a square root trick, Isaac Newton's square root trick, and that could also be used to solve this limit. Um, however, I should say that that trick actually has to come from somewhere, and if you want to be logically careful about it, uh, the justification for Newton's trick really comes from understanding limits like this. So you have to understand this process to understand how that trick actually works or, or why it works. So the last thing I want to do today is to describe a geometric way to find limits uh, that's particularly useful when you're looking at limits of functions defined geometrically, especially trigonometric limits. So the principle is this, is that sometimes you can squeeze a function between two other functions to figure out its limits. So imagine that you have three functions, f, g, and h. And the values of one function are always less than or equal to the values of another, which are always less than or equal to the values of the third. So they might look like the graph here. Here's f of x, 
I'll try to get the color straight. Here's f of x on the bottom and h of x on top, and g of x is always squeezed in the middle of them. Now, if you have this situation, and the top and the bottom end up, maybe this person is walking upside down here, if as you approach x equals c, and you're on the graph of either f of x or h of x, you approach the same point. And this is true from the left or the right. If this is true, then these two graphs will end up squeezing the graph of g of x in between them, and g of x will also have to approach the same value. This poor person here is going to get squished in the middle and has to approach that same point as well. That's the squeeze principle geometrically as something about limits. So sometimes it will be difficult to compute the limit of a function g of x directly, but we'll be able to squeeze it between two other functions to compute it. So the example that I want to do that illustrates this principle is the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x divided by x. And this will be the function g, and then we'll squeeze it between two others. Uh, but to set this up, I have to do something else, something more uh, geometric first. So that's coming next. So our goal for the end of this lecture is to find the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x over x. And there will be a few parts to our, to our computation. And the first part involves showing that for any small angle x, the sine of that angle is less than or equal to that angle, is less than or equal to the tangent of that angle. And here, I mean that the angle is in radians. So an angle of 2 pi would be the entire circle whereas an angle that's smaller than a quarter circle would be less than pi over 2, I've displayed kind of a small angle x right here. So I want to convince you that the sine of the angle is less than or equal to the angle, which is less than or equal to the tangent of the angle. And this might be a, a review of some long-lost uh, trigonometry. So the key is to look at this picture here and look at three kind of paths. One is well, first we start with an angle of x in the unit circle, so the radius is 1. And then we look at this vertical line here, and we figure out the length of this line, the length of this arc, and the length of this vertical line here. This vertical line is tangent to the arc and intersects this line of angle x right here. Now for the first part, this little line segment down here, this line segment divided by 1 is equal to the sine of x. So the question mark divided by 1, this is, remember this is opposite over hypotenuse from your right triangle trigonometry. And the hypotenuse is equal to um, 1, so and the opposite over the hypotenuse is the sine of the angle. This is, by right triangle trigonometry, the sine of an angle is the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse in the right triangle. So the question mark divided by 1 is the sine of x. So the question mark here is equal to just sine of x. So what we have is, in this picture, we have the sine of x. Now what about this, this arc length? Well this arc length is the length of a unit circle arc whose angle is x. And radian measure is cooked up so that the arc length of the circle, of this circular arc, equals the angle x. When x is 2 pi, you get the full circumference 2 pi. When x is pi over 2, you get a quarter circle, which is pi over 2. So the arc length 
is equal to precisely x. Now finally, what about this? So this is x for this arc. What about this long vertical line segment here? Well, for that we can use a different right triangle. So for sine, we use kind of the small right triangle in the picture. For that one, we can use the right triangle whose base is one, that's a radius of a circle. And if this is our question mark here, then question mark divided by one, our new question mark, maybe I'll do double question mark, double question mark divided by one, this is equal to the opposite side to x divided by the adjacent side to x, that's the one, and that is equal to the tangent of the angle. Again, right triangle trigonometry says the tangent of an angle is the length of the opposite side divided by the length of the adjacent side in a right triangle. So this shows that we have this progression from sine of x to x to tangent of x in these three line segments here. Okay, so next I have to convince you that each one of these is shorter than the next. So now I've shown you that the three green lines here, the vertical line, the arc of a circle, and this vertical line, one is equal to the sine of x, the next is equal to x itself, and the third is equal to tangent of x. So let me explain why, in fact, the first length is less than or equal to the second, and the second is less than or equal to the third. For the first part, why is sine of x less than or equal to x? In fact, less than in this picture. It's because if you look at this diagram, the sine of x is the leg of a right triangle. And if we look at the hypotenuse of the right triangle, h, it's definitely longer than a leg. In any right triangle, the hypotenuse is the longest side. So the sine of x is less than or equal to h. In fact, it's less than this hypotenuse that I've drawn here. And now the hypotenuse is the line segment joining these two points. And the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So the path with length h is definitely shorter than this curved path x because straight paths are the shortest distance between two points. So h is less than x. And that proves this first inequality, sine of x is less than or equal to x. In fact, it's less than as long as x is a positive angle. If x is zero, then it's equal to. Okay, so that proves this part. Why is x less than or equal to the tangent of x? So now I wanna convince you that when x is a small angle, x is less than or equal to the tangent of x. And I've tried to erase um, a lot of the diagram that's kind of irrelevant for this part. What we have from before is that if we look at this length of an arc here, that was x, and this vertical line has length tangent of x. And by kind of reflecting this over, I can find another arc of x and another line segment of length tangent of x. And the way I want you to look at this is as though we had two running tracks. We have one well, they both have the same start point here, and they both have the same finish line here. And along one track, you run along the circular arc from start to finish. And along the other track, instead, you go along the path vertically along this segment, and then kind of diagonally across this segment. And something that you know if you've ever run around a track is that the outside path is always longer than the inside path. This is something that was known to Archimedes that Archimedes used in his measurement of the circle as well. That's a book that Archimedes wrote around 200 BCE. And a result of this principle is that twice the tangent of x is longer than two x's. So I'll just say by the track principle, 
inside tracks are shorter if they both have the same start and finish point. We find that two x's is less than two tangent of x's. And therefore, dividing both sides by two, x is less than tangent of x. So this is kind of the Greek geometry style proof that the sine of x is less than x is less than the tangent of x when x is a small angle. And I just put a less than or equal to because when the angle is zero, these are all three equal to zero. If you want to see this in Desmos, I can look at the graphs of the three functions and they look like this. So on the bottom, you see the graph of, well, in, so in red, I should say, you see the graph of y equals sine of x. Uh, in blue, you see the graph of y equals x. And in green, you see the graph of y equals tangent of x. Now, when you look at positive angles, which is all that I've pictured in the previous one, you see that x is squeezed between the sine of x and the tangent of x. And the same is true for negative x. The squeeze is just in the other order. x is still squeezed between sine of x and tangent of x. Okay, so next we're going to use the squeeze principle to figure out the limit that we want. So we want to prove that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x is equal to something. We want to figure out what this limit is. So this is kind of part two. And we can begin with the inequality that we just proved. The inequality that we just proved was that the sine of x is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to the tangent of x, at least when x is greater than or equal to 0 and a small angle. I don't want to go all the way around the circle or anything silly. Now, if we divide these inequalities by sine of x, well, that sine of x divided by sine of x is 1. x divided by sine of x, I'll just write as x divided by sine of x, and tangent of x divided by sine of x, I'll just leave that as tangent of x divided by sine of x. But remember, from a good trigonometry class like Math 3 or something, that tangent of x divided by the sine of x, well, tangent of x is the sine of x over the cosine of x. So that's the sine of x over cosine of x over sine of x, which is equal to 1 over the cosine of x. So therefore, I can simplify this right side to find that 1 is less than or equal to x over the sine of x is less than or equal to the tangent of x over sine of x, which is 1 over the cosine of x. Taking the reciprocals of everything, so reciprocating if you like, what I find is that the cosine of x, which is here, is less than or equal to the reciprocal of this, which is less than or equal to the reciprocal of 1. I've switched my directions because taking the reciprocal switches big things and small things, so it switches the inequalities. This squeezes sine of x over x between cosine of x and 1. Now there are a few things that I kind of did quickly here. Well, maybe everything I did quickly here. One, when I divided by sine of x throughout, I used the fact that when x is positive at least, I'm not dividing by 0. So this is okay when x is greater than 0. Otherwise, I could get in trouble with dividing by 0 or dividing by a negative number and things like that. Uh, in this step, I think I'm just okay because I'm using the fact that tangent of x over sine of x is 1 over cosine of x. This is okay. And this is okay, taking reciprocals 
as long as I'm not taking the reciprocal of zero. And um, that's okay when x is positive, yeah. Okay, so now I have a squeeze. The cosine of x is less than or equal to the sine of x is less than or equal to 1. Uh, we can plot this in Desmos too. You might want to plot these three functions and you'll see this one between these two. And now we can use the squeeze theorem for limits. The limit as x approaches 0 of cosine of x is equal to 1 because the cosine is a continuous function and cosine of 0 is equal to 1. And the limit as x approaches 0 of this function 1 just the constant function, is equal to 1. So by squeezing, the middle thing is also equal to 1. If you like the graphs, you can have the graph of 1, of cosine of x and the graph of sine of x over x will be squeezed in the middle somehow and since both of these have the same limit so will the graph of or so will the function sine of x over x so I haven't been terribly careful along the way. Some of the algebra only works when x is positive, and so technically the squeeze really gives you something about the limit as you approach zero from the right. But if you do the same thing using negative angles, then you'll see that the limit from the left is the same. Uh, and so the overall limit exists, and it's equal to one. If you walk along the graph of sine of x over x, you're squeezed to find the number one as x approaches zero. This limit occurs all the time in calculus, which is why I've spent so much time on it. Also, I kind of like the proof uh, since it's a geometric proof and we're not gonna do too many of those in this class. Um, but you will need to know time and time again that this limit is equal to one.